So welcome everyone. Our today's presenter is um, Murtaza Shalak from our school, and he's going to talk about threshold uncertainty and climate change. So are you happy to take questions? Uh, uh, yeah, you can ask question anytime. Okay. So, but um, <laughs> we'll try to go for 35 minutes in your presentation. So if you, if you have an explan explanatory question, then you can ask, but then our clarifying question, and then we have 10 minutes for questions. Okay, so thanks. Okay, well, thanks for coming to this uh, presentation. Uh, so this, this uh, paper is uh, on threshold uncertainty and climate change. So I, I will be talking a lot about universe, uh, you know, irreversible changes. Uh, as we know that there are irreversible changes uh, is happening to all the systems. Uh, and recently there are more at attention has been paid to this uh, process. And what, what is the threshold? So we actually experience uh, threshold in a lot of systems. And uh, uh, the thing that uh, the system exhibit uh, threshold behavior are familiar. And if you look at uh, the example of the a boat, if you leaning slightly toward uh, one side of the boat uh, or the canoe, um, it will cause a little bit uh, change or, or switch. Uh, but if you uh, push a bit harder, uh, you, you know, the boat would uh, end up falling. So the idea of the threshold is that where is, is the point when you push a little bit further, then uh, you will go to a different system. And, and both of these systems, uh, uh, if you're far from the threshold, it's harder to, to get to the different systems, so it would be harder to go back to the boat in this example. So when you're looking at the threshold, there are two uh, important processes here. Is a, a trigger, is a push, uh, which for the example of the canoe would be um, you know, pushing against that. And for climate, it could be like increase in the uh, temperature, etc. And also, there is a source of persistence. So if you are, uh, you know, if, for example, the climate change, the temperature increases by a certain level, <coughs> sudden changes will not occur. The, the system will go back to the similar stable state where, uh, for the example of the resistance for the boat, is you know the push of the boat against uh, your leaning. There is also this uh, tipping point concept. Uh, which has different meaning in literature, uh, and it, it is uh, also like similar to the example of the wine glass if you push it a little bit uh, across the threshold. So I'm not talking about the tipping point, but it, it is similar to the idea of the threshold because sometimes they give different definition to the tipping point. Uh, so a lot of, I, I guess you are maybe familiar with uh, with the ball and cup uh, system. Uh, I think biologists mostly know this. And in, in here we have, so the system would be the ball, and the, then the valley is the stability domain. Uh, so if you have, so this is the stability domain. When you push the ball, and then th there will be a resistance against it. So if you assume that this is a ecosystem with a good state, and this is like a uh, not very favorable state, uh, when the disturbance occurs, when it reaches a threshold, it will go to a different state, and it will be much harder for the system to go back to the previous state. And it would also depend on, on your system. So for example, this one is more stable than the other one. So if, if you leave the ball here, it will easily go to the bad state here. And uh, for this picture, you could assume that uh, the land has a good or healthy condition with a lot of plants, etc. And assuming that this is under grazing, uh, high grazing pressure, 
if you release the grazing pressure, it can go back to the high biodiversity state. But if sometimes if you add only one extra sheep, it could push the system to another one, which is very different. And since when you get to that system, it will be very harder to go back to the previous state. And uh, so these uh, ecosystem changes uh, can all, uh, especially happen in, uh, in the lakes, the shallow lakes, when uh, a little bit the chem uh, chemical component of the water changes. It can suddenly go to a different state where there will be um, very, uh, you know, the, the productivity or fish productivity can be much smaller. And an example was the Jamaican Reef in 1978. And then uh, in 1998, you can see the same coral and this phase shift from one state to another would have caused uh, a big disturbance. So if, if we are thinking about, OK, there is a stability domain. and. Uh, assuming that this is what we assume uh, stability domain is and uh, this is the for example if, if this is the bomb would be here originally uh, the assumption is that if there is enough disturbance when the ball reaches in this one so we're just looking at this dot part not the continuous one first if it reaches here then this is the threshold because if it if you push the ball a little bit to the other system or the disturbance is a bit higher it goes to other state but how much do we know this with certainty? It's very hard actually to assess in, in this <coughs> system where, where is the threshold. So if there is another assumption about the threshold, and if it's this one, then actually, uh, so if the valley and the system is here, then the, the threshold will be quite different. And here is the resilience, and the resilience is that when, when you put the push, the system tries to go back to the same uh, condition. <coughs> so that, uh, as we know, there are potential irreversible changes to the system, and these global changes could impose large impact on ecosystem and also the social welfare. So what uh, the, the policy decisions are important, uh, you know, before and after the threshold, and generally. The policymaker would prefer mostly immediate benefit uh, over shifting of a dynamic system or new regime. Because sh shifting the dynamic system uh, has two problems. One of them is that it takes, it can take a very long time, and, but also there is a big uncertainty uh, about it. So in that case, when it's hard to estimate where is uh, the threshold, and you know, <coughs> Up to what temperature uh, are you know the global warming would, for example, uh, result in a sudden change? If we are not sure about that, so the policymaker would generally prefer to obtain profit from what uh, is uh, what they think that they know with certainty, rather than spending money on something that they are not certain uh, about. So for management to avoid switching to a different state and how the policy can affect it, in this presentation, I'm giving two examples. One of them is a simple static uh, model. And the other one is, and then after that, I use the same concept and apply it to a complex climate change model. So here is the simple static system. This is just to understand how this could affect a simple system. How could imposing a threshold uh, have this impact? And then uh, I use it, uh, I use DICE model that has been developed by William Nordhaus uh, and impose a threshold to that model. <clears throat> so here uh, to introduce the uh, different probability of the switch because so we, we have Sudden switch and also so certain uh, threshold and uncertain threshold. To show this, I'm uh, use, uh, using the variable probability function. When 
assuming that P is the probability of failure, and the failure would be crossing the system to an, an unstable, uh, a stable system, uh, which is desirable to a stable system that's not, uh, not desirable. <clears throat> So in this, we have P is the probability of failure, and X is the investment in the management option. And A would show the strength of this relationship. So if the A level is high, then the threshold would, would be sharper, and it would be more certain. So for certain threshold, uh, this is the probability uh, so depending on the level that we, uh, that we give A and B, uh, here we would have a different probability of the switch or probability of the failure against investment in the management. So if you invest in the management with 50 units, then uh, the probability of failure would be zero. This is if you are assuming that the threshold is certain. And as I said, this is a so we don't worry about the units here. It's just for demonstration that how this could impact uh, the optimal solution. So using the variable uh, function, giving different level to the parameter A and B, then we, we can have uh, uncertain threshold where uh, the probability of switch just decreases <laughs> with increase in the amount of the investment. And if we compare these two, so this is the, the uh, to the kind of threshold that I'm imposing to the system. And then adding a cost to that, so what would be the cost? The cost is, well, the investment itself is a cost. So cost of switching, and also cost of switching the system. So if you go to the bad system, there is going to be a lot of uh, uh, economic loss. <coughs> Uh, so net expected cost could be drawn used for uh, when the probability of switch is uncertain. So for, for this one, for different cost of switching, uh, the net expected cost would be different for different investment level. And because the cost of switching here is higher, so the net expected high would be the next uh, the net expected cost would be higher. And that can be also demonstrated for a system that has a certain threshold, where in here, so the investment would become, uh, when, when investment is 50, <coughs> then uh, the probability of switch is zero. And the shape of these functions are different. So then uh, here I've optimized uh, what would be the optimal solution for, in, in uh, so in, in the case of the, certain and uncertain threshold. So in the case of the certain threshold, uh, that uh, we assume that threshold is uncertain, uh, you see the optimal level is higher, and it also increases when the cost of switching increases. Whereas if the, we are assuming a certain threshold, the optimal investment is smaller. And the reason for that is because uh, at the level of the 50, when you are assuming that the investment uh, that you have an uncertain threshold, then you are actually looking that after, after investment of 50, you are still looking at the probability that the switch can occur. Therefore, you, therefore the investment is higher. So therefore, so here uh, we have been looking at uh, switch for different probability distributions. And I also look at a system where, okay, so in here, the mean was 50, but we wanted to see what happened if the investment uh, becomes zero for, uh, for uncertain threshold. Uh, so if, if this is uncertain threshold, if the investment, if the probability of switch it becomes zero at the investment level of 50, then uh, the cost of switching would be smaller uh, at the optimal level. And the main reason is that actually this would show much less risk of switch. So uh, here I presented this uh, for a simple uh, <coughs> static model. And now uh, I would like to <coughs> present uh, the problem to avoid switching a system to a more complex uh, system, which is a climate change model.
Uh, so, so far, the climate records show that the, there are the uh, big and large abrupt changes has happened historically. Uh, if you're looking at, the, for example, uh, what happened in Ice Age, etc., these changes, these big changes, has been also triggered by some kind of threshold. So the so basically the abrupt changes to the climate can occur when the, the system is forced to cross a threshold, as I said. As we know, so generally uh, the assumption is that the temperature is going to increase, and a lot of uh, ice sheets would be melted. That's the. <clears throat> And there are also uh, assumptions about you know, what would be the increase in the sea level rise for different, uh, for different years or different periods. And most of these sea level rise have, have negative impact. And so the, the positive impact, there must be some positive impact, but not, uh, not so, so much. So, um, <clears throat> so if there is a, uh, so for the idea of the sea, sea level rise, uh, Many authors are worried that actually it's, it's going to like increase in the temperature uh, when, it, when the temperature crosses a kind of threshold. There will be a big melt in the ice sheet of Greenland and uh, Antarctica, and it is going to be having a large economic consequences. So therefore, Given that this threshold can exist actually for, the, uh, for finding the policy decision for greenhouse gas emission, it's important to take into the account uh, existence of this threshold. Uh, well, the problem is that with uh, most studies, especially the economic study, they have ignored uh, existence of a threshold uh, beyond which if there is uh, <clears throat> The system goes to a different state that is very undesirable and is going to uh, cause a lot of economic, uh, negative economic consequences. Uh, as I said, so most economic study did not look at, uh, <clears throat> at the problem of the threshold. Uh, one of the well-known uh, economic model is DICE model, or RICE, which was developed by William Nordhaus. Uh, so DICE model is a dynamic integrated climate change economy model, and it is integrated assessment mo model. And it looks, uh, it looks at carbon cycle, climate science, and also how uh, change in the policy would affect cost and benefit, and how to reduce the cost and benefit. Uh, uh, how to, um, what are the cost and benefit of slowing that? And one of the decision uh, for that is, for example, increasing the global uh, tax. So this is a very complex model because it looks at emission uh, across all countries, uh, a lot of countries in the world. Uh, it's a good contribution to the literature what they have done. Uh, but it also simplifies some things, like uh, how increasing temperature is going to cause uh, negative economic uh, impact. So where in, in William Nordhaus model, they uh, look at uh, the damages that would be caused, for example, by, by increasing temperature. And these damages. Uh, so it does not include a pro uh, threshold. Uh, so w uh, one of the criticisms to DICE model was, uh, was what uh, Weizmann uh, talked about. And he said, OK, so the, the damage function for that was very low. Because what DICE assumed is that if the, the, the temperature increases by 7 degree, economic consequences are not going to be very large. So Weizmann showed that. Actually, if you are looking at the fat tail structural uncertainty, you can actually uh, <clears throat> outweigh the effect of the discounting. So what he did is basically, in his model, uh, he imposed a much larger damage if the, degree, if the global warming is going to increase beyond some, some level. Um, perhaps you might want 
to specify fat tail distribution, what it actually means for some people? Yeah, so in uh, so for for that it's uh, it's, a, it's a distribution that you assume that there, there will be generally what it says is that there will be a lot more damage. The the, uh, the problem is that you get a lot of more damage uh, when the temperature increases beyond some degree is going to be a lot sharper. So it's not uh, it's not like uh, uh, like this kind of distribution that the probability would decrease, it's not, but it, the probability of uh, the damage will increase as the temperature increases. So although it's one looked at, you know, uh, exponential increase in the damages as, in, as a result of increasing temperature, uh, he didn't also include any threshold. So there have been some threshold specification to the climate change model, and one of them is that uh, they look at uh, effect of collapse in thermal highland circulation, which well, thermal relates to temperature and highland uh, relates to the salt. It's uh, generally when the uh, warm uh, water close to the equator would uh, go north and or south, the south pole or the north pole, it becomes cooler and then it sinks. So this, there is this circulation. Some studies have, uh, have looked at that, uh, like Keller and uh, so th these people. But they didn't look at the effect of different assumptions about uncertainty. So what would, uh, you know, if we assume that, um, as I say, it's important to ask, uh, you know, the assumption on whether the threshold is, we are gonna know it with certainty or uncertainty, uh, they haven't looked at that. So how, how would that assumption would, uh, would be different? So in here I'm looking uh, at, uh, so I'm doing a novel uh, analysis that look at the impact of certain and uncertain threshold. So this is the damage function that has been, uh, so this is the damage function, and what is the, uh, <clears throat> what is the damage is the loss in GDP due to increase in temperature. So that's how they look at this, uh, uh, this model. And here I'm presenting the net damage function. <clears throat> uh, Nordhaus has assumed this to be the damage function. Uh, and Weizmann assumed this. So as a result, now what I do in here, I would impose a threshold at two degree. Uh, when, when the assumption is the threshold is certain or uncertain, I impose that to the DICE model to see how the optimal global tax would change. So this is the damage function uh, due to global warming for standard dice. So uh, as you see, the GDP loss would increase as global warming increases. Uh, so that one of the criticisms of the dice model is that when you increase, when, uh, when there is like seven degree global warming, only uh, like 10, 20% <coughs> of the GDP is gonna be lost. That's why uh, Weizmann has introduced his um, assumption about the damage function. So as you see there, it's, uh, he assumes this similar uh, damage after like two degree or three and a half, but then and, uh, it increases a lot. And I got this, uh, uh, so, I, random dice model and I got this and then uh, mo modified the damage function of the rice model using the Weizmann uh, that is the uh, damage function that has been distributed. So then I uh, impose a certain and uncertain threshold. Here I'm uh, showing what happened if you are assuming that was at, at two degrees a uh, certain threshold what would be the damage function? So this is the uh, damage function for the uh, DICE model. 
And this line shows the damage function when the threshold is imposed on the dice model. And also here is the damage function when uh, the assumption is that uh, you know we are using the Weizmann uh, damage function, and what happens if there is imposed threshold at two degree, assuming that a lot of uh, ice sheets are going to melt at two degree. So the optim so the then uh, you run the the die the mod modified uh, first. If you run the dice model, you would see that uh, this is the optimal carbon price. And uh, when I impose the sharp threshold, it means that at two degree, there will be 10% loss in GDP. Uh, there is a very sharp increase in carbon tax to a very extremely high level, which looks very unrealistic that you know, the country would pay like $400 or $600 uh, per carbon tax. And basically what, what this is trying to do when you impose a sharp threshold is that the model says that you have to, uh, you know, put a lot of carbon tax in order to not cross this two degree limit. And I wanted to see how the carbon tax would be different if uh, assumption about the threshold is different. So this is for assumption that the threshold is certain. And here is, uh, I'm comparing the optimal carbon tax for base case, which is this is the dice model, and when the smooth threshold has, or uh, threshold with uncertainty has been imposed. So as you see, it's a big difference between uh, the carbon tax when you are assuming there is a certain or uncertain threshold. And if I put both models together, as you see, a certain threshold would impose a lot of tax, whereas the uncertain threshold is going to uh, just impose a small tax. So given that we don't know, uh, we, we don't know with certainty what degree is going to be that this threshold is going to happen, and a lot of ice smells are, uh, are going to happen. So if we are assuming a certain threshold, then actually the policy is going to be dramatically different. And here is the optimal uh, global warming until north has damage function. So it's optimal, if you are seeing a sharp threshold, it's optimal to actually, uh, as, as you see, uh, impose a lot of carbon tax in order to stop global warming so that it doesn't reach two degree. Whereas if you are assuming a smooth threshold, then Global warming will be smaller if uh, if you are imposing the threshold, but uh, but it allows to go beyond two degrees. So after modifying the dice model to um, to incorporate the Weizmann damage function, I did the same for uh, certain and uncertain threshold. So it's it's very similar. In case of the Weizmann, when you impose certain or uncertain threshold, the, the differences, as you see, the sharp threshold would assume a much higher carbon tax. And also, the optimal global warming is similar. Although the levels are different, but the, the shapes are similar. So now, here you can see the optimal carbon price for optimal global warming. So this is uh, <coughs> under. A sharp threshold, as you see, the carbon, optimal carbon price increases sharply so that you don't cross the two degree uh, threshold. Whereas, if the assumption is the smooth threshold, then uh, the, uh, the increase in carbon tax is much smaller. So, here are the conclusion that there are basically irreversible changes to the ecosystem, and efficient uh, management can stop uh, crossing this threshold. There are uncertainty about th threshold, and this uncertainty are very important. And also, I showed that how uh, different it is if you are uh, looking at a static, uh, simple model. The results are going to be very different to a system that that is dynamic. And um, so, also I showed that uh, whether we assume a certain or a certain threshold, the optimal global policy for climate change would be very different. And this difference is much 
larger than not assuming a thresh threshold in the first, first place. So it means that, as uh, you can see in this, in this figure, so that the difference between uh, imposing a smooth threshold uh, or uncertain threshold as compared to having no threshold, the difference in terms of the optimal carbon tax or the decision is going to be smaller than assuming an uncertain threshold as compared to a certain threshold. OK, well, thanks very much. And if you have any questions, Yeah, I can handle it. But maybe it could help. What is this picture? Uh, this, this picture, I took it in uh, Queens, Queenstown in New Zealand. Start off with a softball question. <laughs> yeah, it was not, not that easy, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes. So, like, what's, what's but but she raised her hand first. OK. <laughs> Can you go to the, to go back to the final slide about the relationship between the uh, optimal carbon price and optimal uh, yes that one? I don't understand why that a carbon price at a very low level is optimal and then the the global warming degree is, is that low. I thought that it would work in opposite way. It means that when you set the carbon price high, it had to reduce the yeah, degree yeah. of global warming. So why you? You see, the trend is like a correlation. So the carbon price higher makes the global warming degree increase. So what does it mean? Yeah, so the, the, they, they both are optimal. Yeah. So, um, so here you have the op optimal <coughs> global warming. So it's not, it's not uh, the, uh, so as, um, as the global warming, so as the carbon price, so optimal carbon price, so sorry, as the, Global warming increases, yeah. the, then the carbon price also increases. So at the optimal level. Uh, so the so your question is that why? So you assume that yeah. when you increase the carbon exactly. price, so it reduced the level the level of CO two emissions. So it had to reduce the the, 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 the decrease of the global warming. So it's not the carbon price higher makes the global. Yeah. So the <clears throat> the optimal carbon price does not necessarily mean that if you impose it, you will, the global warming would be decreased. What it does, it's just uh, slow it down. Yeah. So it tries to slow it down, so it's not really, uh, you know, it's not uh, cost efficient uh, or cost effective to, uh, to impose so much tax to reduce it. So the, the aim is not necessarily to make, to cool down the, Earth temperature, it's to uh, to reduce the damages. So you can reduce the damages and still have uh, increased global warming. So the optimal global warming degree based on which criteria? Is it the, the GDP? Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so based on yeah, you are the adding the GDP of uh, oh, you okay. know, all all the countries in the world. Okay. <coughs> Oh, this wasn't my question, but now we're here, it will be. Um, <laughs> I've got one model. Presumably, there's one optimal global warming level. Mm -hmm. So, what's happening along, under what circumstances is the optimal global warming one degree, and other times it's three, and other times it's three and a half? In what sense can I have, a, can I have an axis that's got variable levels of optimal global warming? Isn't there just one optimal level of global warming? Uh, yes, for each year you would have, but as you as uh, so th this is uh, this is basically I put the result of the <coughs> two uh, two results together. So is there a time a time index going along those lines? That yeah. So this isn't equilibrium optimal global warming. This is the optimal global warming at different points in time as it evolves through along the system. Yeah. Okay, didn't get that. Mm. Um, so I think then my answer. Yeah, so this is, that's right. So this is a, like, as I said, yeah, 
global one, it's not at one point. It's, uh, it's at the... So then, my original question, when you put the thresholds in, I was thinking thresholds are just basically about the probabilities of flipping from one system to another, current one to the next one, and you may flip over. And it's not smooth and you can't get back. But when you put your thresholds in, you didn't just change the probability of flipping over from one to the other, you actually changed what the outcome was. So, yeah. so, so, what, what we, so you've made, so it's not just the, the transition, you know, you're heading on a precipice and then over you go, you've actually now made the damage is bigger with the threshold model yeah. than they were with the base one. Yes. So it's not just threshold effect, it's also the, si the size of the equilibrium effect, or the final effect, where we're going to end up. Okay, so let's... It depends whether he's done that symmetrically. In other words, if, if the threshold okay. doesn't happen, do you... Do you so the, the, these, are, these are the two threshold, okay? So when, when I'm assuming that uh, this is a certain threshold, which means that uh, I impose to the model that when you get the two degree, then when it becomes 2.1, then there will be 10% GDP loss to the system. Okay. That's not, I want to do the damage curves. Damage, ah, uh, yes, yeah. So, there, so all of a sudden, when you get the threshold in, you don't just suddenly jump more to, to, to uh, move faster to the new equilibrium, we've actually got, you've gone from a nine, an 85% damage at, <coughs> at 8% up to a 90, you haven't just changed the transition, you've changed the, the impact. Uh, so I impose, so what I did in here, I imposed a probable, uh, I imposed a fact to the model that at two degree, there will be 10% GDP loss due to melting of the ice sheets. And that's an additional effect as compared... Yeah, it is an additional effect, yeah. So, so what I was thinking for the, for the a threshold effect for the white one would be that the green, line, the yellow line goes along, it jumps up, and then it goes and rejoins the white one effect. So when we hit 8% global warming, we're definitely there. We're in, we've made the transition, and we'd end up with the same level of impact, irrespective yeah, of the if, threshold. If, I mean, if, I, if I'm adding to this one, to the to Yes, yeah, so uh, I'm not clear why the threshold adds, as opposed to just talks about the transition. Oh, is that just oh you mean that, like, now this one is much smaller than this one? No, is that in that the red and the blue, at 8%, for some reason, the red and the blue you are higher. Green? Uh -huh. The, and the green and the... Sorry, which one is blue? Is this one? The green <laughs> should, which one's blue? The top one. Are you saying that the red okay. and the green should meet, meet up? The yeah, at the, at the end, if, if it's about thresholds and jumping across boundaries, once I've crossed the boundary, either certain or uncertainly, yeah. I will end up in the same mess I would be. It's about transitions, not about destinations. Oh, Whereas okay. you so change the destination. Uh, so you mean if you if you impose a threshold, then you would have a jump, and then you go back because eventually the same amount of ice would be melted. Yeah. Whether I go there fast or whatever, it's a quick one. At eight degrees, it's it's we're in deep trouble. And whether I got there with a the transition or whether a fast transition or a slow transition at eight degrees, the end result is in trouble. Mm. So that red line actually should be joining up. The uh, blue line, or the, the different trajectory, maybe going yeah. like this, oh, okay. big, big belly. And yeah, yeah. And the same with the top one. You can jump, yeah. and then it'll rejoin, and off you go. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess, uh, well, I could uh, look at which degree would impose that much damage, and then try to put this uh, curves together. Yeah. Have, have you tried with uh, different percentages of? Um, damage cost, like you mentioned, the ten percent damage cost. Because if you, uh, what what happens if you only have zero percent damage cost, and uh, how how these lines behave? Uh, zero percent damage cost. Yeah, you said that you have added ten percent damage cost with. Uh, oh yeah. So yes. if you, and, this is and, the zero percent damage cost. Uh, you mean uh, so we, we you mean you assume that there is damage but there is no cost? No, no. You you have this additional ten percent damage cost. Yeah. 
have you changed look at the variation like um, from zero to going for twenty percent or something? And how oh, you mean been? you mean doing a sensitivity analysis yeah, yeah, for yeah. that? Yeah. So for different level of that, still uh, the same. My, yeah. My point was what, how what would be the uh, you know the, the optimal policy in terms of imposing <coughs> that this would be the same. Of course, if if it is less than this, then the, so this difference is going to be smaller. But still, uh, when it is a sharp threshold, then um, so th there will be a jump, but the jump would be a, a bit smaller. Maybe more Tesla's right, and they don't join up because the system changes. So the threshold, if it was just melting the polar ice caps, then they would catch up much way before eight degrees, so they'll catch up at four or five degrees. But, you know, there's all these other cycles of damage kicking in. So maybe they don't even stay in parallel, maybe they diverge. Well, I don't think what does is model the ecology of those systems collapsing. It's just added 10% through to the lines and said, my new model is one where everything gets worse by 10% at a particular threshold. Well, my the oh. might go to the golden blue line where things are really going haywire. Yeah, I, I guess so it's like yeah. yeah, it's probably also knowing that up to what degree we are going to have all the ice melted. So if the ice all are melted here, a degree or I don't know how much, then then uh, then they will be the same line. If yeah, but. I mean, once you lose, I mean, you don't have to go out to eight. Once you lose half the global GDP, things are pretty seriously bad. Yeah, I, yeah, when you look at the literature, they talk a lot about two degrees, so. Your, your just clarification here, all these future damages are discounted. Yeah, yeah, this is the North House's DICE model, I don't know if you know, but yeah, they dis discounted it. Do you know about the work, work done by Ari Rabel? Mm. He wrote, used to work for World Bank of which was, did a lot of work in there. Oh, okay. He has an interesting point of view, and it looks at what he calls an economic trap. The economic trap is that, okay, this looks optimal from, from now, because it's uncertainty. Um, but the, I think the, the concept he uses is sort of minimum regret kind of approach. Okay, but now we push yourself into the future and look back and say, boy, that was really, really a suboptimal decision. <laughs> 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 and so he says, how would I? To make a decision from the point of view of the future. And so he's actually basically optimizing backwards and optimizing uh, forwards. Hmm. And um, uh, there's some interesting calculations where he actually tried to mix both. Um, it's interesting, you get different results. Hmm. And so his idea is, you know, it's a bit like what's happened with salinity here in WA. It was optimal in the 1920s or 30s to actually export cement. But now we've come to the point where it's not economic to do anything about it. Okay, so we've trapped ourselves. We're in the in the hole. It's like this um, this space of attraction, the, the high costs, low benefits, and it's become uneconomic to get out of the hole. And so we're digging our hole there, perhaps. And so the the um, the, uh, the the problem becomes how to minimize the probability of my being digging myself into a hole. Mm -hmm. and the only way to do this is look at it from the future and optimize backwards. Yeah. That's, you could have a very different result. Yeah. So, what discount rate does it use? Um, it uses uh, William, I mean, what rate? I think, uh, I don't think that it's just using, uh, well, I actually don't know, <laughs> to, to, to be honest, but the thing is that it's using the William North houses. I mean, if I look at the literature, I can see. So what I did is that the GAMS model, I used the GAMS model of William North House, and I imposed this threshold without changing the, I think, I think we have to stop yet. Thank you, Matilda. Okay, thanks very so much. So